It's my uh, great privilege today to welcome you to the uh, Dean Speaker Series for this quarter. Uh, the Dean Speaker Series is a series we do uh, every quarter, uh, run by the Center for Applied Learning. So I'd like to give a shout out and a thank you to my colleagues, uh, Kate Barker and Mark Openlander for planning this event. Um, as you know, they run our wonderful mentor program and the social venture competition among lots of other uh, applied learning experiences. So. Uh, many thanks to them for organizing today's event. And then I also want to thank and welcome uh, my colleagues, Dr. Drozdover and Dr. Mason and their classes in economics and in, in politics, uh, political science. Thanks for uh, participating today and then welcome many other students across other disciplines on campus that have, a wonderful, have an interest in our, our topic today. Um, and then I uh, just want to uh, just give you all a general well, warm welcome. Thanks for participating today. It's, these, these events are um, one of our uh, you know, high points in the year for student engagement beyond the classroom. And we pride ourselves for uh, making available and bringing in wonderful leaders in our community, uh, working on tremendous problems, big problems, uh, to discuss those with you and to get exposure to them and, their, and, and what the areas they're working in. And so we're just delighted today on that note then to uh, welcome Dr. Marguerite Rowe. Welcome, Marguerite, good to have you today. Um, we are honored to have her because uh, she is currently the chief uh, of the Assessment Policy Development and Evaluation Unit and Director of Chronic Disease and Injury Prevention section of our public health system for Seattle and Kim County. Uh, Dr. Rowe, just a little bit about her background, received her BA in chemistry from Reed College in Portland, and she has both her master's and doctorate in public health uh, from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Dr. Rowe has focused her efforts over the years in working with diverse communities to achieve health equity for our nation's most at-risk populations. As, director, as deputy director of the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum, a national health advocacy organization. She has played a significant leadership role in Health Through Action, a groundbreaking partnership to close health gaps for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. During her time as a professor at Columbia University, uh, Dr. Rose served as a senior policy analyst for the Kellogg Foundation uh, Foundation's Initiative on Community Voices, a national demonstration project uh, to improve access to health care for vulnerable communities. Uh, in addition, she has been a former member of the Centers for Disease Control Advisory Committee to the Director of the Health Disparities Subcommittee and a past chair of the Department of Health and Human Services Advisory Committee for, Environment, for Minority Health. Uh, Dr. Rowe, in addition, is the 2018 recipient of the Washington State Public Health Association's Public Health Leadership Award. So um, with that uh, background and a little bit of uh, understanding of uh, who Dr. Rowe is, we just welcome her and are delighted that she's spending some time with us. We're, and I'm sure it's an absolutely incredibly busy time, Marguerite. And so we just really appreciate you spending some time with us today and sharing with our students and our community. So well welcome from the School of Business, Government and Economics. Thank you. Really appreciate um, being here. I'm going to move to sharing my screen and hope, hopefully that you all can see my screen. Um, would somebody give me an indication that in fact you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you. Um, so thank you to Dr. Stewart, uh, to Mr. Oppenlander, and to Ms. Barker. Um, for this opportunity to have a little, uh, to have a chance to talk with you all. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit about myself. Um, thank you for the warm introduction, Dr. Stewart. Um, and then we'll do a couple of things. Um, I wanna talk about, uh, give you an update on COVID and vaccinations because you can't have somebody from the public health department uh, coming to talk to you without um, mentioning certainly COVID and what's happening right now. And then uh, we'll go through a little bit of a case study on, on food security in, um, in the context of the pandemic. And we'll talk about our response that we've had in King County. Um, and oh, sorry, 
Sorry about that. Quickly, we've got to learn how to use this. Um, and so let me first start by telling you a little bit uh, about myself a little bit more. So because I know a number of you are, well, most of you are still in school and just how I got to where I am and um, a little bit about public health because I, my, since you're in the business school and school of economics, it's um, in government, it, uh, it's a little bit far away from public health. So anyway, so I'm originally from here, from the Seattle Tacoma um, area. And um, as you heard from after I left Reed, I actually went to the East Coast. And that's actually where I discovered public health. And I discovered it through my volunteer activities and uh, eventually decided to make it my career. I spent um, the early part of my career working to create visibility of what was happening in local communities across the US notably around the issue around health disparities. Um, and that was to really drive solutions at a national level. And by that, I really mean about influencing policy and changing systems so that they work for everybody. And so unlike many folks who start working locally and ended up to the national level, I actually spent a good portion of my career working nationally and then, um, and then going local when I moved back here to the Seattle region. Um, and so happy to answer questions about a little bit about that experience. Um, I'll just say that uh, I've been in the health department for about 10 years. And so before that, I spent a good portion of my career actually trying to influence government and uh, decided that it would be a good idea to be inside of government. Um, so it's great to have, uh, I'm really appreciative of having both experiences. So public health, as you see on the slide here, um, I named the talk protecting and promoting the public's health and because that is in fact the job of pub the public health department and uh, for many of you, you may know our work in terms of protecting our food and water. So every time pre pandemic that you went to, um, for instance, one of our restaurants, you would see the little sign where there's either a smiley face or an unhappy face or just a face with kind of a a straight line. That's some of the work that we do. Um, we also uh, are part of the healthcare safety net. And what that means is that we are sure that everyone has access to health care that they need. Uh, we monitor the health of our communities. That's part of the assessment work that I oversee in the um, in the department. And we respond to crises like the pandemic. So um, our funding comes from a mix of sources that include federal, state, and local funding, but we also seek out grants and contracts, philanthropy, and other sources um, because public health, as you may have heard in the news, has been traditionally really underfunded. And you know, when we're doing our job right in a time that isn't during a pandemic or a crisis, you won't know that we're actually there necessarily because what we're doing is we're working to to make the, a healthy environment the easiest and, and, and safest environment for everyone. So, um, like I said, I wanted to start with a couple of slides around uh, coronavirus. And so, um, you'll see here on coronavirus, uh, here, here is that, in fact, um, we're on a downward trend. Um, so, you can see since about January 9th to where we are today, the number of positive cases is declining. On the bottom half of the slide, however, you see the, um, the metrics. Uh, these are the new metrics that were set out by the governor uh, for Washington's roadmap to recovery. Puget Sound is, um, region is currently in phase two, and that means when you look below um, at the number of metrics where it's the COVID cases, the hospital admissions, the ICU occupancy, occupancy rate, and the test positivity rate, we need to be um, we need to have uh, be um, meeting the target in at least three of the four categories, and so one of the things you'll see um, just if you're looking at this and you're wondering, well, it looks like in fact cases are going up because you see this plus four percent. That's really just um, because of the the differences of when that data was collected, and that data really reflects this period where you see this little bit of a peak around. The January 9th. But as you can see, the good news is that we look like we're on a downward trend. 
So this is the vaccination data that um, I want to share with you, and you can find all of this data at um, kingcounty.gov slash COVID, and you'll see that we have a number of dashboards as well as resources, and you can find the information. Um, you've been hearing about this, I presume, in the news. Um, you know, uh, we are actively working really hard to stand up vaccination sites with our partners. Um, and we've managed to date to, um, to give out over 200,000 doses. And you'll see that um, we've had over 180,000 individuals who have received at least one dose and another uh, 30, 38,000 or so who've been fully vaccinated. Um, really right now, it's just a, a, a waiting game of making sure that we get enough doses. We are, um, if you are familiar and looking at the different phases, we're in phase uh, 1B1, and that is making sure that those who are most vulnerable are in fact getting vaccines. I'm going to transition to food security, so let me just do a quick pause here, Mark, and see if there are um, any questions that folks would like to ask. I'm, Happy to pause here to uh, answer one or two questions um, about COVID or the vaccine, if folks have any. You can either go off mute or put something in the yeah. q and I um, posted this to the chat folks, but if you have questions, drop them in the Q&A. We can take questions some now, and the, especially about the uh, coronavirus. And then we'll take more questions at the end. So use the Q&A to put in questions. You can also upvote questions that you like. Not an open question yet. All right. Well, then I'll keep going. And um, feel, free, feel free to pause. Um, so folks, feel free to um, put in questions as, you, um, as, you, as they come up. Um, so oh. We do have Okay. You have one question. Um, mm -hmm. Responses are being faced with uh, vaccine di uh, di dissemination right now. Pardon me? What challenges are being faced with vaccine dissemination right now? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of challenges that we're facing. Um, some, the biggest challenges I mentioned to you is making sure that, in fact, we have the uh, sufficient doses of, of, um, of vaccinations. The second thing is really around as you think about, so King County, we've got 2.2 million residents. So as you can see, um, 219,000 is just a drop in the bucket. So the question is, how do we rapidly um, get all of our populations access? And so some of that is really coordination and thinking about all parts of the county. Now, just as we um, have also tried to, give, to um, get people tested, you have to think about all the challenges with um, making sure that there's sufficient access by transportation, which is why you will see us stand up sites that are um, where folks can either drive, but there are folks who need who are walking, uh, who need to have a walk up ability because they don't own a car. Um, and also folks who live in congregate um, housing. And so that might be nursing homes or other care facilities where uh, folks can't, can't readily come out of their homes. And so we've been working with folks like the Seattle Fire Department and the King County Fire Department um, to, uh, or the Puget Sound Fire, fire System to, to um, get to stand up mobile units and to stand up pop-up vaccination sites and those kinds of things. But the other uh, major challenge is a lot of dis and misinformation about vaccines. And so um, helping people understand the science behind it um, and also answering all of the questions that they have um, are some of the biggest challenges that we have. I have a, a follow-up uh, question since you just mentioned um, misinformation. Uh, somebody asked, what's the most detrimental attitude about the pandemic and stopping the spread? So what, what piece of public mindset, I guess, um, is actually <laughs> difficult to overcome? Yeah, there is a, a funny enough, there's still um, not there, there are two things. One is people who still don't believe in don't believe that coronavirus exists. And the the second is, I think, the fear or what we're thinking or what they're calling vaccine hesitancy. And that's for a number of reasons. 
you know, there are um, a lot of good reasons as we move into the our, our conversation around why there's distrust of government and distrust um, of science. And um, certainly those are major, major problems that we are um, coming across uh, in addressing COVID. So um, with that, Mark, is it okay if I keep moving on? But I'm happy to come back to questions at the end. Yeah, we have more questions about COVID specifically. So <laughs> when, when we're at the end, I will um, bring some of these questions perhaps back in. And some of them do deal with inequities in the system, so. Great, um, and, and I know we could spend, quite frankly, an hour and a half on that. So uh, I'm gonna keep going then. All right, here we go. So, uh, and Mark, you'll just have to, uh, if we're running too late, let me know and I'll, I'll try to move a little quicker. So the other issue that I want to raise, and um, you know, as we ended 2020, one of the things that really came across were, in fact, these inequities. And um, uh, for a number of reasons, um, as you know, um, what I will say is that in King County, our response was that um, on June 11th, our county executive, Gal Constantine, declare, um, uh, declared racism as a public health crisis. And by doing so, really wanted to set the context that all of King County government is committed to implementing a racially equitable response to um, the crisis and the crisis being inequities overall and the acknowledgement of structural and systemic racism that occurs. Um, and, and that this really sets the context, um, particularly uh, of what we're doing today, as well as going forward when we think about what um, King County's policy priorities will be as we move further into 21 and 22, as well as our budget. So that's one piece that I want to keep, have you keep in mind. So the other thing that we learned in, around the pandemic is it really highlighted the inequities that exist in our community. So if we were to look at the data, and I'm sure that you've heard that our Black, uh, Indigenous, and people of color communities in particularly in particular have been hardest hit with COVID. And so as we think about the work that we're doing in King County, issues like the King County Equity and Social Justice Ordinance become really critical in our governmental response. So we were the first county in the nation, in fact, to pass the Equity and Social Justice Ordinance. And importantly, it talks and sets out, um, you'll see there I've pulled out a couple of quotes around, the, the, around uh, section one, which really talks about a principle of fair and just. And then in section two, it lays out this framework where, where in King County, we think about um, the determinants of equity. And again, thinking about the social, economic, geographical, political, and physical environment in which we live in. And that it, ultimately our goal is to have equity for all people, regardless of race, class, gender, or language spoken, and I will also say place. So here are the 14 determinants of equity um, that, that we had identified, ranging from everything from access to affordable, healthy local food, to things that you would um, expect, right? Health and human services, affordable, safe, quality housing, uh, to um, things like an equitable law and justice system, um, certainly really important um, is equity in county practices, um, education, and, you know, ultimately what we are really interested is in having strong and vibrant neighborhoods and communities. So again, just a little bit of a deeper dive here. Um, what does it mean? It means for us operationally that we have to apply equity and social justice foundational practices to our actions and that's in our programming, it's to our budget, it's to our, um, our planning. Um, and then um, uh, one of the things that happened over the uh, last couple of years was also this um, issue that was raised um, that, that we've also seen, which is, is that um, at times we have different, po different um, parts of our population or uh, communities that have been under attack. And certainly in the last several years, one of the things that we have seen is we've seen um, uh, some, uh, some actions that have been taken particularly around our uh, immigrant and uh, undocumented communities. 
And so the King County Council in response to that um, put forward an ordinance called Keeping Our Family Safe. And this has been promulgated in our rules and regulations. And what this really does um, is it protects the rights of all county residents regardless of status. And importantly here, the, what I want you to see is that as a county then, um, it means that we will not deny anyone services based on their immigration status. And um, sometimes that is a little trickier um, to, to, to do than others, and I'll talk about that within the context of food security. So um, going on to food, secure, in, food insecurity during the pandemic, and there are three things that I want you to keep in mind and three considerations. One is obviously the need and the demand um, uh, because we had rising food insecurity, and I'll show you some data in a second. Um, the second is as, as, we, as we entered into the pandemic, we've always had an emergency food distribution system. So by that, I, I'm really talking about food banks and um, those community-based organizations and those other efforts by sectors to ensure that um, individuals um, don't, don't go hungry. And so you can also think about school meals, um, which you're probably familiar with. Um, that's another way that's part of our emergency food distribution system. And then the third consideration that I want you to hold in your mind is the food production and distribution system. So um, what this slide shows, and this is, um, this is a, a piece of art that de depicts um, our Pacific Islander Community Association of Washington that operates here in uh, the Pacific Northwest, King County in particular, um, and showing that, uh, their work that they do in terms of food distribution uh, which they had been doing already, but that certainly was stepped up um, during the pandemic. So going on to some of our data. So food, insecure, in, food insecurity nearly doubled after um, we implemented the strategies to slow the spread of COVID. So that's the social distancing, that's the closure of restaurants and places to gather, uh, encouragement to stay at home and so forth. And so um, there, it, there is a survey that is conducted and it's a, a, a census, it's done by the Census Bureau and it's a pulse survey, meaning that they um, ask questions on a weekly basis to understand the conditions that communities and, and folks are living in. And here what we've seen is the most recent data show that uh, you know, over 7% of adults reported in December that their households didn't have enough food during the last seven days. Um, we did see huge increases in that, uh, especially in terms of July and mid-July, we saw that going up to 11%, so over one in 10. Um, and, uh, you know, um, households who didn't have enough food to eat uh, also reported that 30% um, of them also reported that children were not eating enough because they couldn't afford food. And certainly we've also heard some of the other stories about what's particularly happening around um, college campuses as well. So um, looking again at that data from the Pulse survey, and this is what we found that the adults who were most likely to report not having enough to eat, and this is through the period of August through December is that it's not to any surprise, perhaps the lowest income households are the ones who reported uh, who were more likely to report not having enough food to eat. Um, in terms of race and ethnicity, we saw this particularly with American Indian and Alaska Natives, as well as Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders. Uh, folks who have less than a high school education, younger adults between 18 and 44 years of age. And of course, those who were unemployed, self-employed, or working in a family business. I want to give you another perspective, though, of how deep this, this issue around food insecurity runs and the inequities that exist in the system. So this is from a survey, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey, and it asks a different question. It asks the question of, um, did you have enough food essentially? Or was there a period of time over the last 12 months where um, you didn't have enough food? And here what, what we see here is 
out of a hundred, every, every hundred black adults, there are 40 black adults who have experienced food insecurity over the past 12 months. Compared to white adults in King County, so out of 100 white adults who were asked, nine of those white adults reported being food insecure compared um, uh, over the past 12 months. So you can see that in terms of communities that are impacted, certainly by race and ethnicity, we know that there are certain groups that are much more uh, impacted than others. Whoops. Here's another way to look at it. This is around food um, and food assistance. And I'm wanting to show you um, where, um, where food insecurity hits the hardest. And not perhaps to no surprise, um, South King County, this is a map of South King County. We're here up in, up in Seattle, right? Up here somewhere. Um, Seattle is one of those, uh, Seattle King County, uh, this is the South King County region tends to be where our um, low income communities, as well as our uh, black indigenous and people of color communities um, reside. So as I mentioned, so the, this covers sort of the demand issue. So um, this was a this, this next slide um, is a picture from a review of um, 2020 in the Seattle Times. And I want to call your attention to the, like, um, the first couple sentences on the right, where, where it describes the picture and what you're seeing. It says, a worker plows under 240 acres of young potatoes farmed by Mike Pink near Pasco. The potato crop had fallen victim to the pandemic pandemic upending the frozen french fry global market. So um, what I've presented to you earlier is in fact that we've got people who are routinely going hungry and in fact during the pandemic where um, uh, food insecurity was growing and yet on the production side we're seeing farmers having to plow under their crops. So um, we have in King County what's called the Local Food Initiative. And this is some older data, but again, as you all think about from a business perspective and from a policy perspective, um, here's what some data that we had. And this again is pre-pandemic, where you can see that many farmers are struggling. And in fact, King County's farmers are spending $2,700 more per year to produce food than they're earning back, right? And that in fact, over half of King County farmers rely on additional income sources to support their operations and family. Um, and you can see um, that there are ideas about how it could in fact be more robust. So now I'm gonna move a little and just remind you around the policy parameters that in King County that we're operating in. Um, Two of those we've already talked about, the equity and social justice ordinance and then our keeping our family safe ordinance. And the way that it works in county government is we might have an idea, but that idea then needs to go to the executive's office for approval and then it needs to go to King County Council uh, for approval on the use of the dollars in order to stand up a food security assistance program that we were looking at doing last summer. And um, you can see that the council gave us a couple of expenditure restrictions on the dollars that we were awarded. And that is that they said that grants are, uh, uh, that grants must be given to organizations um, with board members and employees who represent historically disadvantaged communities that have been disproportionately impacted by inequities and discrimination. And that they, um, uh, instructed us to assure that program recipients would be able to acquire culturally appropriate foods. So these were the conditions in which we had to shape a food security assistance program. So in terms of the food, we had, we received about $5 million. Um, of that $5 million, uh, we worked with Safeway and to provide about 2.1 million in vouchers. We worked with organizations, um, community-based organizations, and uh, so that they could purchase culturally appropriate foods and distribute them out to their communities. And then one of the things that we 
we're hearing over and over again was that the emergency food distribution system that we have was overwhelmed and that we needed to shore up, in fact, their infrastructure. So our priorities, again, we're focusing on the communities that were hardest hit by the pandemic, increasing access to culturally relevant, nutritious food, and then strengthening our community food distribution programs. Ultimately, um, I want to say that uh, we awarded uh, 30 community-based organizations and agencies. They were heavily fo focused on South King County, where, we, where you saw on the map in the darkest blue. Um, and we also recognized that there were many cultural communities that were experiencing um, food insecurity. And so the communities that, we, uh, that were identified in the awarded proposal ranges everything from our Black, Indigenous, and communities of color, but also to um, our LGBTQ population, our homeless population, uh, people living with disabilities, or um, folks uh, who were survival, survivors of domestic violence and or previously incarcerated as, um, as vulnerable populations that would benefit from our uh, food security program. So a couple of pictures just to, so you can see, really uplifting, I hope, around um, a couple of organizations that really uh, took up the challenge and the task of getting the food out. So this is the Center for Multicultural Health. Here's again, uh, you saw a little bit of artwork from Piccola, and here's some of the work that they were doing. Feeding El Pueblo um, that serves the Latinx community in Highline. You can see the cars lined up, some of those long distribution lines that we've seen. In the distance, you'll also see that we've got, uh, they were able to leverage a, a four culture grant so that they could have musicians at this event as well and some of the work that they did. And so I'm gonna end here with a challenge to all of you. Um, from my perspective, you know, our food security assistance program that we were only able to provide up through December 30th because they were used with federal dollars. And um, let me also just add that the federal dollars um, uh, were challenging, uh, have some challenges with them in terms of how they can be used and, and who, who can have access to them. But as a county, we always around with additional resources and dollars to make a program whole. Um, but it's a short-term fix. And um, obviously, if we are still in a position where we have farmers who are having to plow under their crops, we have people going hungry, our food system is in fact broken. And so I would ask you all, how would you fix it? And how do we create the systemic change that we need so that no one in the US ever goes hungry. Okay, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and open it, and we can open it up to questions. Thank you, Dr. Rowe. Um, we have a number of questions. I'm gonna to try to um, get to as many of them as we can in the next 20 minutes or so, but I'm, I'm looking specifically at the ones that have the, the highest interest. And some of these are COVID related, some of these are in sure. system related, and some of them are food security specific. Um, first one here is about uh, the dis uh, disbursement of vaccines again, and it's asking how does is Seattle King County looking to include racial equity in the disbursement of vaccines? So a, a couple of things. We um, have done a lot in terms of working with our uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color uh, communities. Um, some of that, uh, we when the, when the pandemic first hit, we actually stood up a couple of different groups. Um, one was a, a pandemic advisory group uh, representing both different sectors, but our communities of color in particular to help inform us and to give us the information that we need to best structure um, our, our programs, including our vaccine distribution efforts. Um, in addition to that, we have community navigators and we're working with others really around messaging and so forth. And so um, there's been a lot of attention, particularly to um, standing up high volume uh, vaccine distribution centers. Uh, there are two that have just uh, been opened in this, uh, I think this week. 
um, both in Auburn and in Kent, because uh, we recognize both uh, that South King County um, is an area where, again, lots of uh, larger po proportions of our of people of color living down there who have been disproportionately impacted. So the other thing that we're doing is continuing to work with different groups on messaging um, so that they bet so they can understand what it means uh, to have vaccine, uh, etc. So I know there will be more questions. So let me stop there because otherwise I'll keep going. All right. Uh, the next one relates to food security. Um, this has gotten some interest as well. Asking, were all schools in King County required to provide meals for students who are dependent on the school for breakfast and lunch, or was it up to each individual school district? Um, so we don't, as a health department, we don't have the power to require school districts to do that, but uh, we certainly worked with every school district to make them aware of the challenge, and then every school district had uh, dis decided what they could do and how they wanted to provide um, uh, those resources. The follow-up, and this is about the question of culturally relevant food. Um, the questioner wants to know, what do you mean by culturally relevant food and why is it important? So, um, importantly, um, one of the things around equity is, is um, the question of, of, of what, what food do people, what, what, what is considered um, acceptable and uh, food that, that folks would enjoy? So everyone should have a, the right to enjoy foods, right? So w one example, for instance, is um, uh, not everyone uh, can or is, is accustomed to eating, for instance, mac and cheese, right? And so particularly in King County, where we have um, a huge racially, ethnically diverse population, we have uh, a growing population of um, Af African-born immigrants. We have seen waves of, um, of uh, Asian immigrants. We have waves of um, certainly uh, Latinx immigrants coming uh, from Mexico, from Central and South America. And so um, really that's the intent is, is is not um, making everyone eat the same thing, but actually um, making sure that that their food culture is respected. Um, and so that's why you saw some of that language around culturally relevant. Great. Food. This, this next question is, uh, I think, a little bit provocative, and I'm curious to see how you'll you'll answer it because um, it has had some interest from a couple of different students. Do you feel that King County, Seattle, and King County public health exacerbated the spread and deaths of COVID-19 by encouraging mass gatherings in the streets in June of 2020. So I, I presume we're talking about the, uh, the demonstrations and protests after the George Floyd incident. Um, so in the way that the language was written, uh, um, so um, I think that uh, this was a challenging time. I, I would say that it wasn't around encouraging, but but respecting the fact that our communities and especially our communities uh, that were um, in pain and uh, uh, that 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 was a balance there just as it is is opening restaurants in some ways and businesses is making sure that communities have a voice and um, it was up to every individual and so what we did is that we worked to assure that for those who were going to be marching out in the streets to the degree that they understood um, what the risks were. And, um, and then you had many public health staff out distribute, distributing masks as well. So I don't know if I would say encourage. Um, I don't think there was a call by King County government to come out, but there was a respect for the fact that, um, that people wanted to be out in the streets protesting and calling for justice. Um, here's another one about kind of the, um, the ways public policy has been used to help uh, with the um, coronavirus. Do you see a discrepancy between the guidelines of the keeping our families safe ordinance and what is actually being implemented or reported? And how, how successful ultimately would you consider the keeping our families safe ordinance? 
So this is a real challenge, right? Um, and and uh, this is a challenge with different levels of government from the federal government to state government to local government to the degrees that data and information can be protected and be safe, right? Um, and also then um, making sure that uh, we, that by our actions, for instance, that we are not unintentionally putting individuals at risk. So um, uh, it's, it's sort of a, a slight pivot, but you'll understand, I hope, what I mean. So our um, community health centers or our clinics that we run really are, are run for, for anybody and everybody who, who, who needs to have care and doesn't have care in a different way. Uh, one of the concerns in 2018 that was raised was um, to the degree that immigration and customs enforcement would be uh, coming um, to our clinics to identify individuals who may have been undocumented. And so we worked a lot with our prosecuting attorney's office and obviously you saw the result of having the ordinance there and of working to ensure that individuals who need our services could come and receive our services. That also means that, for instance, services that we may provide in those clinics for some individuals would not be funded with federal dollars which have restrictions on them. It's been the same with our um, COVID response in working, and this is why we work a lot with community-based organizations and have um, community navigators who are individuals from those communities who come not only to share again what the experiences of those individuals are but to also be that liaison and those trusted messengers with information into assuring that whether it's our resources from um, king county government or from philanthropy or from other sectors that um, individuals are connected to the resources that they need i'm going to flip over to a um food security question and then back to COVID. Uh, food security is thought of as a given in a lot of the developed world. Would you say that we truly are in dire economic straits or were we never as secure as we believed ourselves to be? Um, I will say that we have never been as secure as we thought ourselves to be, but more importantly, the, the, we, the structurally we have a problem. It shouldn't, I, I, I mean, it's crazy that, that, that we are such a, um, that we have the ability to, to produce so much food and yet we can't get it out to the people who 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 live in our country and who 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 need or benefit from it um from my perspective um food is a basic right it's one of our basic rights that we should all have here's a question about the kind of the long-term trajectory of coronavirus does the public health community see our communities going back to normal pre-covid 19 sometime in the future, or do we foresee having what has been called the new normal permanently? Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to give you my, my opinion um, based off of the information that I know and from what I have heard and listened to and learned about. Um, I think we will have coronavirus, this form of coronavirus with us for the long haul. But I think that over time, um, we will come to a new normal um, and it will be through a combination of, of vac vaccines, of, um, of improved treatments. Um, and, you know, if we'll see if we can get to that point of herd immunity um, so that this becomes less and less of an issue. I don't know uh, when I will actually ever shake hands with anyone ever again. So that may not be part of the new normal. But I will have people yeah. at some point. Someone has asked, how different is the EUA, I assume this is the emergency youth authorization, than a typical FDA approval? So the um, uh, emergency use approval is uh, is one where you know they've gone through all of the scientific rigor, but um, in order to actually receive approval, you actually need to complete um, the clinical trials. And by complete the clinical trials, it includes um, a, a longer longitudinal um, study of of vaccines and their um, and their uh, and the impacts. 
So there's a lot that we don't know. So there's essentially a phase four of the clinical trial, which monitors people who have been vaccinated and will monitor them six months and longer out. And, and that's what's still not completed and that needs to be completed in order for approval to happen. And it's expected that every vaccine that has gotten the emergency approval will actually eventually be approved. We have a question regarding food vouchers and SNAP funds. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a way to encourage recipients of SNAP and food vouchers to use these funds at local markets in order to support local food producers and to experience the nutritional benefits of eating closer to home? That's a great idea. So one of the other challenges that we have is um, particularly for small um, uh, small grocers uh, and small shops that they um, may not have uh, they may not have those systems in place. Um, there's a there's some work that has to be done in order for them to accept those vouchers, uh, but that's something that we continuously work on over time. And so there's an element that we do in our healthy eating team, which is to work with um, some of those grocers as well as um, some of the uh, um, our food markets, our outdoor food markets, um, to be able to have that capacity. Technology required. Uh, someone has asked, how have community gardens and greenhouses been utilized during the pandemic, specifically to address food security needs? Um, that's certainly a popular, uh, that's certainly been a popular um, trend that, that has happened. Um, I don't think it's sufficient. It's one that um, I think is really popular here in the Northwest. We have pea patches all over. Yeah. Um, there is a question here that I'm not quite sure I understand. So it's an, it's an anonymous question. So I'm going to ask the person who asked about the, the systemic killing of small businesses. I would like clarification on that before we address it. So whoever asked that question wants to put an extra comment there. I'm trying to understand what you mean by that. I'm going to skip to the next one, which says, we all know that uh, minority communities have a distrust when it comes to vaccines. Is there an education that will help in gaining that trust? So we have put out a lot of materials. We actually translate our materials in about 30 plus different languages. Um, I have a partnership with, uh, a, or my, what my team has a partnership, for instance, with um, uh, uh, a group called Healthier Here, and we have over 30, part, I think we have 32 community partners representing really distinct uh, communities within King County. And one of the things that they are funded to do is to go out and um, answer questions, just like I'm doing today um, with you all, um, but to also really promote uh, messaging and so that, that people at least, so, so at the end of the day, here's what I would say, is that um, related to vaccinations, um, as well as te testing and so forth, is that um, people need to make informed decisions. Uh, and so the best thing that we can do is provide um, accurate, um, timely information to folks, and then they can de decide on their own um, how they want to, what they, how they choose to act. Here's a question about um, local and urban farming practice. How important do you believe it is to encourage urban farming and local practices and communities to encourage food stability? And are there other practices you believe will be important in the future, I assume, toward food security? Um, I think it's a really complex issue and uh, uh, there's a lot of work and I would um, have you look up if you, you know, get on our website, kingcounty.gov and look up the local food initiative. And you'll see the work that we've been doing. We've been pulling together for the past, oh, I don't know, four years or so. Um, you know, uh, our distributors, our, our restaurant owners, uh, you know, it's like the dairy council is there, our local farmers are there uh, to figure out, as well as county government, to figure out what kind of resources and what kind of partnerships can stand up strengthening our food system, especially our local food system. Uh, so a lot of works to, um, that includes, you know, the purchase of land to assure that it's available for farming. You know, certainly when I grew up, uh, 
I'll just say, uh, if, you, if you've ever been down to, uh, like my first job was picking strawberries in Puyallup, good luck at finding a strawberry farm in Puyallup anymore, right? So, it, it, so we've lost a lot of farmland. So we, we both need to um, uh, preserve land for, farm la for farms and also support those farmers in the, that industry so that they can survive. I have a question coming in through the chat here. It's um, a discussion that I can't see, but uh, one of our professors is bringing it forward. It's the question of how is the funding being targeted to different uh, racial, ethnic, and other marginalized groups, especially for food security? And, and is there anything you know unjust about that kind of targeting you know, various groups one over the other? Um, uh, so, as as you saw that there was a, a, a long list of, um, of, of folks. So it wasn't just uh, people of color who were getting the, getting the food. I think that um, this is really about uh, uh, focused, focusing our efforts on those with the greatest need. Um, and, and so um, we'll just say that it, it that we acknowledge up front that, that our work and our efforts are insufficient um, because the need is far too great. And so, you know, we're fortunate in King County that we have um, a lot of efforts going on, um, both in the private sector as well as the public sector to try to address this problem. But it is right now a piecemeal solution. A uh, question about how do we encourage stores to better compensate for produce? So I, I'm guessing that this has to do with um, food deserts, places that don't have a lot of access to produce. Are there ways to incentivize that? I'm interpreting the question. So if that's not correct, whoever asked it, please correct me. But I'm assuming they're asking, how do we incentivize stores to carry more produce? So, I mean, that's part of our local tax structure that we have to be paying attention to, right? What are incentives? What are disincentives to do that? I mean, there's certainly that. There are certainly partnerships that we work on in, in terms of as we think about community development as a whole. Um, the other thing that I will say, um, and, and for those of you who, who are more familiar with um, the, our food systems, is that we know that grocers uh, run on a very small margin, right? Or there's a, a very tight margin that that they operate on. Um, that's why I say that our food system is broken, <laughs> um, and that and that we 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 really need to think outside of the box um, so that so that um, everyone survives in terms of from production to distribution uh, to those who receive who who receive and need the food. Uh, someone has asked, how do we get involved? Are there job openings in your area regarding food security specifically or, or th other things that they can do to get involved, I guess, with, with food security? Um, so, sir, I'll just say that I think that there are a lot of efforts um, going on. I think uh, one is, is if this is a passion and there's interest, um, just like everything else, uh, there's so many ways to get involved. Um, Certainly, if you were to look at the county and our work, um, a lot of our work uh, on the food production and distribution side is done with um, our Department of Natural Parks and Resources. Um, they are the ones who really work on that distribution side. Our Department of Community and Human Services um, that runs levies and uh, employment programs, food programs as well. That's another area. And then in public health, um, occasionally we also have jobs, for instance, like in my shop around healthy eating and active living. Um, certainly uh, our schools, our universities often have um, areas of research where are related to food security. So lots of different ways to get involved here. Um. We have a couple, we just have a couple of minutes left here before our official time is over. And there's several questions related to vaccine distribution that came up earlier, mm -hmm. kind of related. So I'm gonna to try to get a couple of them in rapid fire here. Um, one person asked, is there an updated vaccine allocation timeline given the current vaccine administration rate? And then related to that, when do we estimate that the entire Washington population might have access to the vaccine? Um, 
So unfortunately, we never we don't actually know for sure about what vaccine we'll get. And generally, it's been like we get a week's notice. Um, but I will say that it's been projected that um, in a couple of weeks that we expect that the flow of vaccines will increase. So that's really good news because right now we like I think the last week we got only 40% of what we had gotten the week before. And so really, really difficult um, uh, situation. Mark, what was the, the second part of that question? Um, when do we uh, estimate that the entire population might have access? Um, we realized that, or I think there were some calculations that we needed to be vaccinating at uh, 16,000 individuals per day. And that would be in our optimum sort of perspective. As you can imagine, we are not providing 16,000 vaccinations currently per day. Um, so uh, we're ho really hoping probably for late summer, fall, maybe. I hope it would be better to be sooner than later. I, I certainly know I would love to be out and I imagine you all would as well, so. Well, I, I uh, we do have a few open questions, but I also wanna respect everybody's time. So if we didn't get to your question uh, today, um, I will try to get some of these uh, off of this uh, the, the transcript here and maybe get those to Dr. Rowe later and, and get answers to sure. some, maybe. Happy to do that. Happy to send answers forward. And uh, let me just say, this has been a really tough period for, for absolutely everybody. And um, uh, especially for students. Um, uh, my, my daughter is a college student and she's, she's, you know, she's taking classes from home. It's certainly not been ideal at all. Um, so, so thank you for hanging in there. Um, it, it, it is tough, it will get better. Please, please wear masks, please stay safe. Um, and, and we'll get there. Thank you. I'm going to hand the virtual mic back over to Dr. Stewart. Uh, Dr. Rowe, I just want to say uh, thank you very much for spending some time with us today. Thanks for sharing a little bit about your background with us. And thanks for addressing these incredibly important issues of coronavirus and uh, food insecurity. We're just uh, appreciative of your insights and your expertise and very grateful uh, and for your passion and, and for your interest in this subject. And thanks for all that you do in King County. So thanks again for coming. Thanks to everyone for being involved. Appreciate Dr. Mason and Dr. Drozdova for partnering for the uh, Center for Applied Learning. And thank you, Mark and Kate. Uh, good day to you all. Thank you. <laughs>